Rabbis, welcome. Um, this is a nice opportunity. I've taught this class of Kisugyot to students here over the course of the year several times, but I've never had a chance to bring it beyond these walls, so this is really a pleasure for me. Uh, let me begin with a few rules. Uh, I'm going to assume that you've had the opportunity to prepare these texts with your chavruta or alone, so we're going to be doing some very quick referencing. In addition, unlike a normal classroom, obviously I can't evoke directly questions, but we will have a Blackboard site, and I intend to participate in that actively. So I look forward to the discussion. It just won't be a discussion that we have right now. I've selected these texts because I think they relate to Jewish life, and particularly the life of a rabbi uh, in his or her community, particularly the synagogue, but beyond the synagogue as well. And I have a purpose in this. Uh, as you will see, I, I will always ask questions that seek to challenge what might be termed the common wisdom. I want to raise some new possibilities in all of the things that we'll be studying. And my hope is that the possibilities will be sufficiently new that they will provoke some questions. So that's our direction. We begin with Hanukkah, quite simply because as I sit here and we tape this, this is the first day of Hanukkah. And so it seems appropriate that this would be the place we begin. Uh, as you all know from the syllabus, the texts, the primary text we'll be dealing with is from the Gemara in Shabbat. But I have also recommended to you a reading from a wonderful book, which I will actually reference here quite directly. That is Jenna Jocelyn's book, The Wonders of America. And she has a very important part of the history of Hanukkah that I think we need to share. I begin with a commonplace. The commonplace that I have myself stated, and I'm sure you have found yourselves both teaching and asking others to repeat, is that Hanukkah is a quote-unquote minor holiday. The proof of that uh, often comes from traditional sources where we note to others that Hanukkah does not attract a great deal of attention, although I'm not sure that's fully correct, and I want to correct that as we go on. Uh, you may have learned in one of your classes, I know that I learned in one of my classes here at JTS, that Hanukkah must have been a minor holiday because, after all, it's barely mentioned in the first rabbinic text, the Mishnah. Uh, it has no tractate in the Mishnah, and therefore the rabbis must have considered it relatively minor. This, even though Hanukkah was a rabbinic holiday, of course, this is used to also support the notion that it's a minor holiday, that is to say that it is a rabbinic creation, rabbinic in quotes, uh, and not a holiday that derives from the Torah. Um, to tell you the truth, I want to challenge all of this, and I'll begin with this lesson itself and then go to the uh, Gemara. It's quite true that the Mishnah barely mentions Hanukkah, but the fact that the Mishnah doesn't mention something is no proof of its insignificance. In fact, as you all know, when you think about this in another realm, one of the most surprising characteristics of the Mishnah is that it clearly omits significant discussion of things that are, by all accounts, very significant. For example, you will be hard-pressed to find very much in the Mishnah about the scribal creation of a Sefer Torah. Uh, and yet, we all know that the Torah, as an object, as something which is central to study and the ritual of Rabbinic Judaism, uh, that centrality is undeniable. And so the fact that the Mishnah doesn't treat something is no proof of the fact that the rabbis didn't consider it to be important. Uh, the so-called minor tractates, the Masech Tonot, Ketanot, all contain uh, discussion of things that the Mishnah itself omitted, and yet all would agree that these are significant parts of Rabbinic Judaism. Uh, so this alleged proof is no proof at all. It's actually quite ridiculous. Um, what's also worth noting is that when the Mishnah does mention Hanukkah in passing, it actually lends it a prominence or an importance which is, I think, also undeniable. In the midst of the Gemara that we will study here, that you've studied amongst yourselves, you saw a quotation of a Mishnah from Baba Kama. Uh, you, you'll find this on uh, Kaf Alev Amun Bet, near the bottom of the page. 
the part that's relevant here uh, is the part discussing liability for damages when a fire has been created either by a shopkeeper in a shook um, because he has put his flame outside to light the way uh, or by a camel driver or someone whose beast is bearing a burden through the shook uh, and if the straw goes inside the realm of the shop uh, and catches fire then the owner of the animal the one who's passing through will have liability needless to say uh, if the shopkeeper puts the lamp outside, as the Mishnah says, uh, uh, makes sense. Liability will be the shopkeepers if the lamp is outside. But now the important modification, Rabbi Yehuda Omer, Bener Chanukah Patur. If the lamp that the shopkeeper has put outside is the Hanukkah lamp, then the liability will not be that of the shopkeeper because the shopkeeper is performing a mitzvah. Now this is a significant statement because living in the closed quarters of a shuk, uh, to say that there's no longer liability if the lamp, the flame that you're using is performing a mitzvah, that mitzvah's got to be pretty important. So the absence of liability here, the ptor, um, is itself a statement of the importance of Hanukkah. This is only the beginning. I'd like to now add what the Gemara adds based upon uh, Breitot and other teachings. If we stay on the same page, beginning on uh, 21b, um, there are a series of directions regarding how the mitzvah is to be performed, that is to say where the lamp is to be placed. So a little bit further up on this page, Ner Chanukah mitzvah l'anicha al petach beto mi bachutz. There's a mitzvah to put it outside. This is, of course, what leads to the discussion of liability that we just saw in the Mishnah. Im hayad dar baliyah, manicha bechalona smuchal rishudarabim. If you lived in an upper floor, then the obligation is to put it in an opening, a chalon, we call that a window, but it just means an open space to let air in onto the public domain. Um, and all of this is in order to assure that it be seen, of course. This will be expanded. Um, and a crucial addition, which I'll come back to, while using this light in one's residence, if one lives on an upper floor, um, I think it would be less a question outside, one mes must nevertheless have another flame to be able to use its light. The question, of course, is why. There are obvious answers and then less obvious but equally as important answers. Going on here, the bottom of the same page. Ner Chanukah mitzvah l'anicha betoch asara. There is a mitzvah to place the Ner Chanukah um, Asara here means at eye level or within an easy eye level. Uh, and the contrast to this, uh, which appears on the top of the next page, Ner shal Chanukah she'enicha l'malami esrim ama psula kisuka ukimavoi. If it's above 20 amot, above uh, 20 forearms lengths, then it's not good. Like a sukkah, which would be too high, uh, and like a roof and the entrance way um, that helps form the a roof, the association to sukkah is one that many of you will recognize because the connection of sukkah and Hanukkah is a well-known one. The question that's to be asked here, though, is why this particular association? And in both cases, it comes to seeing, to noticing. The mitzvah of sukkah, the schach on the top, and perhaps by derivation, the candle, so-called, the light of Hanukkah, must be within a frame where it can easily be seen. Best for it to be at the level of the body so that it can very easily be seen. If it's above 20 amot, it no longer counts because it's outside of eye view. Um, then, uh, one final, Amar Rava, Ner Hanukkah Mitzvah Lanicha, it's got to be right adjacent to uh, the entranceway. Uh, a question is asked, right or left, and then this beautiful notion that it must be 
on the opposite side of the mezuzah. So mezuzah on right, the candle, the flame of Hanukkah on the left, in order to surround you with a mitzvot uh, as you go through the entranceway. Uh, visibility, obviousness, public, this is outside, uh, not inside, unless by compromise. Uh, some of you may know the experience of going through uh, Jerusalem religious neighborhoods in Israel. I remember this experience from the old city, the Jewish quarter of Jerusalem, where so beautifully when you walk through on Hanukkah, literally door after door after door, outside of the entrance to the courtyards, you've got the Hanukkah lamps, uh, the oil protected by glass so that the flame doesn't go out, lined up door by door to announce publicly uh, that this is the mitzvah being performed. And now another reservation. Um, I'm on the same page, 22a, Amarav Yudan, Amarav Asi, maybe Amarav, Asur Lart Sot Ma'od Keneged Ner Hanukkah. You can't use the light of the Ner Hanukkah uh, in order to count coins thereby. Um, then on the next page, 22b, uh, question. The question is asked whether it's the lighting of the candle that is the performance of the mitzvah uh, or whether it's the placing it in the appropriate place which is the performance of the mitzvah. Several times here um, a particular possibility is reinterpreted by reference to the recognition that doing it one way as opposed to another might lead to a misinterpretation. Um, what is that misinterpretation? Hatamaroe, Omer, the one who sees it, might say, Lutzorchohu denakit la. He's taking it for his own individual purposes, or in the next statement, Aroehu Omer, Lutzorchohu de Adlaka, right? He's lighting it for his own purposes. Uh, why all of this concern that it not be interpreted as an individual use, that it not be used for individual purposes? Uh, there is, of course, in this world, that is to say the world of Chazal, no such thing as a Hanukkiah. Uh, the particular menorah, so-called, for Hanukkah is a modern invention. By modern, I need, mean uh, primarily early modern. In the ancient world, it was common oil lamps that would be used to perform this mitzvah. And so the question became centrally, how do you recognize that what's being done here is a mitzvah, the mitzvah, as opposed to simply putting a lamp outside your door? Well, what made a Hanukkah lamp a Hanukkah lamp? The answer is it was done during the days of Hanukkah during a, Hanukkah during a particular time. You all know from the time it gets dark until the regel is no longer heard in the shuk. That is to say, it has to be done while there are still people passing by in the shuk. Um, and finally, it's got to be placed properly and not used for other purposes. The moment it's used for other purposes, for individual purposes, it's no longer a Hanukkah lamp. It's simply a normal lamp, which is what it would be at other times uh, without the specific restrictions being applied. The concern all along is recognition, and that's central to what's being done here. Some of you uh, may have known the discussion from beforehand, but in my mind, the most important, important part of this very long discussion in the Gemara is the one found on 23b. Um, and so I'd like to look at it very closely. Uh, a, a teaching first of Rava and then a question. Amar Rava, pshitali, ner beto v'ner Hanukkah, ner beto adif. The question arises if you have only very limited funds and you can afford to purchase with those funds either only the oil for the lamp of your household or the oil for the lamp of Hanukkah, which takes precedence. Rabbi says it's obvious to him that the lamp for the household takes precedence. Why Mishum Shlom Beto? Uh, because of the peace of the household. That is to say, you need to be able to see in your household, and if you can't, this will lead to uh, less than shalom, less than uh, peace or well, you can interpret it as you like. Um, but there, Hanukkah lamp comes second. He goes on then and says, Ne'er beto v'kidush hayom, right? Uh, if you have only enough to afford oil for your own household lamp or to purchase the wine for Kiddush for Shabbat, again, the household lamp takes precedence over the ritual performance because of the needs of the household. 
But now, by implication, we've got the question, and he goes on to make it explicit. Um, by Rava, Ner Hanukkah Kiddush Hayom, Mahu, if you can afford only either the lamp of Hanukkah or Kiddush of Shabbat, the wine for Kiddush, which takes precedence. Now, I'll ask the question. Every time I've taught this, I've asked the question. What would you guess? Right, which takes precedent? Kiddush for Shabbat or the lamp for Hanukkah? Uh, well, in my experience, without exception, when people have analyzed this, they say, well, Shabbat is from the Torah. Shabbat is obviously much more important as a holiday. Hanukkah is a minor holiday, and as a minor holiday, uh, only rabbinic, not from the Torah, it should be secondary. And so, without exception, uh, in my experience in the past, the guess has been, um, sorry folks, uh, obviously Shabbat takes precedence. So you buy the wine for Kiddush, uh, as you've seen here, um, the Gemara answers opposite to what we might expect. Um, first of all, it lays out the question, Kiddush Hayom Adif de Tadir, maybe Kiddush comes, takes precedence because it's more frequent. Odil Maner Hanukkah Adif Mishum Pirsume Niso. You look at reasons and you see that the purpose, and this comes back to everything we've seen before, the purpose of the Ner of Hanukkah um, is in order to advertise the miracle. Uh, and then, in an interesting conclusion here, Batar de Bay Hadar Pashta, Rava, after asking the question, uh, recognizes that the answer is obvious, and that obvious answer is that Ner Hanukkah Adif, the lamp of Hanukkah takes, pres Hanukkah takes precedence, Mishum Pirsume Nisa, because it advertises the miracle. Um, Hanukkah, in this respect, takes precedence over the ritual advertisement, as it were, the ritual notice of Shabbat, because this is a unique and special recognition of God's intervention in history uh, of the Hanukkah events, which are here defined as miracle, and advertising the miracle through the observance of Hanukkah takes precedence. That's clear. Um, there is no doubt in my mind that the length of this Gemara, the specificity with which it works on the uh, ritual, makes it clear that in the rabbi's mind this is a very important holiday, not minor at all. Crucially, in the midst of this discussion, it also discusses on 23a, how can we be saying the brachot over the Hanukkah candles, um, asher, you know, asher kitshav mitzvah zatav vitzivana, where did God command us, the Gemara asks. And it provides its answer. There are many rabbinic commandments where this question could have been asked. It asks it here in order to emphasize that what originates as rabbinic becomes, as it were, Torah when the rabbis say it does. That's the chutzpah of this, um, and it is the declaration of the importance. Now, um, I asked you to look at Jocelyn because Jocelyn tells an earlier part of this history which I found very striking. Um, beginning on page 230 of her book, uh, when Jews first came to this country, immigrants in the late 19th and through the first couple of decades of the 20th century, um, they knew what it took to become a good American. Uh, look at her, her reports here. Being a good American meant uh, doing what those around you did, and so they bought Christmas trees. Virtually no one, um, whatever their backgrounds had been, was celebrating Hanukkah. And in recognition of this and concern, over this neglect, rabbis and other community leaders were speaking out on behalf of Hanukkah. Jews should observe Hanukkah because Hanukkah is a very important observance. Um, in the 50s, um, this is in the late 50s, I'm reading here from page 240, a study found uh, that Chicago middle class, middle class Jews in Chicago um, close to 40% decorated their homes with a Christmas tree. That's what assimilation is, right? Christmas tree. Uh, now, Jews hate good news. Uh, and so when, in the 60s and beyond, Christmas trees became less and less frequent, and interestingly, in the um, Jewish population survey uh, of 1990, uh, it indicates that in Jewish households, not mixed households, but Jewish households, 82% would never imagine having a Christmas tree. Uh, this number probably only rises later on in Jewish households, not in mixed households. It's no longer an issue. And yet, how has the rhetoric changed? We become anxious because Jews begin celebrating a holiday, Hanukkah, without a Christmas tree, but making a big deal out of Hanukkah, 
Uh, and our anxiety tells us that this is an act of assimilation, not a good thing. And so we, I heard this myself as uh, a younger Jew, perhaps many of you did. I'm quite sure that many of you have taught this. Um, Hanukkah is a minor holiday. Don't celebrate it like Christmas because we say to ourselves um, that this is an act of assimilation. Well, I've got to tell you, I can't think of a worse act of assimilation than when our Christian neighbors go out uh, and celebrate their holiday with Christmas trees and the like. We don't do Christmas trees. We dafka find an alternative symbol, a Hanukkiah, and we celebrate what in the Gemara's mind is an absolutely crucial celebration, Jewish celebration, advertising the miracle, and we say, no, we are not you, and by we here I mean our many congregants, those in our communities who in very large numbers light the Hanukkah cam candles. We are not you. We have a parallel celebration to be sure, but it's a celebration of a Jewish identity in recognition of a Jewish miracle, uh, and they, better than we, therefore, appreciate um, that this is a very important holiday. I must tell you, they are celebrated in this, um, I should say they should, are supported in this by the Gemara very, very clearly. Um, we contradict ourselves um, when we try to diminish this. Um, at first we said important holiday. We then got anxious that people actually learned from us and began celebrating it, celebrating it greatly. So our anxiety led for us to say, no, 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 minor holiday. Uh, we should learn from our congregants. Um, they are the ones who intuit, intuit what the Gemara says here. Pirsume uh, Nisa Adif. Pirsume Nisa takes precedence. And so I would say in conclusion, uh, who are the only Jews today who really get it right, uh, the celebration of Hanukkah? Well, I don't know how it's done in your community, but in my community here in New York City, the only ones I've seen get it really right um, are Chabad. Um, when they put up that great big Hanukkah in the square out in front of the plaza at 5th Avenue and 59th Street, very, very large. I know of no better uh, advertisement of the miracle than that. That is the model that the Gemara wants us to emulate. I look forward to our discussion.